Millican University sits on the west end of Decatur, Illinois. The university was established in 1901 by James Millican. Millican University is a private institution that offers both traditional and non-traditional degrees in arts and sciences. It has a current student population of about 2,200 students, and with its 119 years of history, it's no surprise that it's picked up a few ghosts along the way. The land that the university was built on was already somewhat tortured. One of its first uses was as a training facility and enlisting site for the 116th Illinois Infantry, a regiment of the Union Army during the Civil War. Decatur was an integral part of the war efforts, particularly in the training and recruiting of troops. In fact, wooden barracks once stood where the Schilling Building now stands. The university's haunted history is certainly not hurt by the presence of a Catholic cemetery on its northern border. The St. Patrick's Catholic Church bought this plot, which later became Calvary Cemetery in 1871. The property, primarily prairie land, sat unused after the Civil War ended in 1865. James Milliken bought the remaining 16 acres of prairie land where the university now resides from Amos Robinson and construction on the university began in 1900. Construction was slow and there were several setbacks, particularly in the getting of materials. The cornerstone for the first building was laid in 1902. Hauntings are often associated with water, and Milliken had an abundance. The West End Lake was on the property and was actually preventing the university from expanding. This problem was solved in 1902, when the lake was completely drained except for the stream head, which still runs under the university today. The university has continued to grow since then, and now includes buildings like the Conservatory of Music, Gorin Library, the Griswold Center, and the Kirkland Fine Arts Building. So who was James Milliken, the founder of Milliken University, and what drove him to establish the school? Milliken was from Pennsylvania, and he and his father were sheep farmers. One of their business endeavors was to trek sheep from Pennsylvania to Illinois. The boom towns of Illinois needed meat, and this endeavor turned out to be very profitable for the family. Soon they leased pasture land in Illinois and moved on to the raising of cattle. This was also extremely profitable, and soon Milliken was known as the cattle king of the prairie state. In 1856, with a profit of $75,000, equivalent to $2.5 million today, James settled in Decatur, which thanks to the railroad had just become a boomtown and was growing quickly. Milliken bought a considerable amount of land and built a large home settling in as a prominent figure in the community. A year later, he married Anna M. Aston, whose father was an evangelist minister and pastor of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Mount Zion, Illinois. The Aston family heralded from Washington, Pennsylvania, so she and James had a lot in common. Anna was an educated woman. She graduated from the Washington Female Seminary and was teaching school when she and James met. They had a long life together and had been married for 52 years when James died in 1909. James Milliken was involved in the politics of the day and was a close friend and avid supporter of Abraham Lincoln. He backed President Lincoln as the Republican candidate in 1860 and even served as the interim Macon County Supervisor for a time. James was known to have impeccable business acumen, and perhaps his biggest business success occurred in 1860 when he decided to open a bank. Decatur was booming but turbulent, and the railroad bank had failed. Mr. Milliken didn't have any experience in banking, but after being persuaded by some friends, he started his own bank. He started simply by hanging a sign on Merchant Street advertising J. Milliken Banker. His leadership of the bank led it to develop a reputation for being both safe and stable, and over time, the bank became successful. This success allowed Milliken to help and support the community of Decatur. This seemed to be his life goal, and he gave generously to the community. This included the university. Milliken University started off as a satellite offshoot of Lincoln College in Lincoln, Illinois. Lincoln College was chosen as a charter school because it was also affiliated with the Presbyterian Church. James Milliken arranged for the charter in 1901, and construction was commenced. He donated land 
and the money, only asking the local government and local churches to match his own donations. The university was dedicated on June 4, 1903, and President Theodore Roosevelt spoke at the dedication ceremony. Many of the town's notable residents, including Dr. Albert Taylor, the new president of the university, and James Milliken were present. It was a dignified celebration that included fireworks and a late picnic. The first official day of classes for Milliken University began on September 15, 1903. It is reported that when James Milliken faced his first audience of 562 enrolled students, he bowed and couldn't keep from crying. He had put his life into this university and didn't expect such a grand number of students for quite some time. Amazingly enough, James Milliken never spoke at his university as he was never comfortable with public speaking. Most of his students knew him as the kind and quiet man who was happy just being part of the crowd at the university events. His funeral in 1909 was well attended and a large line of students gathered in procession to his gravesite. The legacy that James Milliken left brought hope and a new era to central Illinois. It seems that with such humble beginnings for a university, there would be no room for hauntings, but history sometimes has a way of making room for the unknown strange and the bizarre. Perhaps the earliest hauntings were those of the Native American spirits that the early settlers believed haunted the area. Or perhaps the origin stems from the emotions and the residual energy of the Civil War camp or the Catholic cemetery on the grounds. Whatever the case, Millican University is haunted. One of the most talked about ghosts at Millican University is the Rail Girl. And her home is the Albert Taylor Theater named after the university's first president. She is called the Rail Girl because she is often seen along the rail of the upper part of the theater. This ghost is well known among the theater students because her presence usually means problems during their performances. The Rail Girl's origin story is unknown, but there has been plenty of speculation and legends abound. One such legend says that the little girl who haunts the theater craves attention and she gets this attention from the actors and the stage crew. Because of this, there is a long-standing tradition of leaving three pieces of candy for the ghost before any performances. Leaving the candy pacifies her and provides tribute so that she will not cause havoc, tear up the sets, or ruin the show in any way. Thespians are a rather superstitious lot anyway. Who else says break a leg and considers it good luck? However, the rail girl ritual has its basis in experience. There are many reports of things in the theater disappearing and then reappearing in strange places, as well as numerous reports of disembodied footsteps and sounds of weeping. One story is told of a local alumni who used to work in the theater department. She had a formidable experience in the early 1990s when she was involved in a play at the theater. Some of the other theater group told her about the rail girl but she refused to believe in the resident ghost. She even went as far as to laugh at her friends who brought candy for the ghost on opening night. The woman was in costume and ready to perform when something horrible happened. As she was going down a flight of steps towards the stage, she felt two small hands grab her ankles. The hands were coming through a solid area beneath the stairs. There was no way anyone could have reached through but the feeling of hands and fingers was distinct, and she looked down thinking someone was playing a bad joke or a prank on her. When she looked down, nothing was there. Something invisible was attacking her, holding her legs. She continued to fight against it until her feet were swiftly pulled out from underneath her, causing her to fall. She tumbled down the stairs before hitting her head on the floor and blacking out. She obviously missed her performance that night and was bruised for several weeks. While still not an ardent believer in the rail girl, she wisely chose from then on to show the apparition proper respect and leave candy for the ghost at each subsequent performance. The rail girl's appetite for tribute may also be growing. Nate Claus tells another terrifying tale. Nate was a theater student and theater assistant manager during the 2000-2001 school year. The stage manager didn't believe in the rail girl, so as the assistant manager took it upon himself to leave the obligatory three pieces of candy for the ghost. 
Unfortunately, it seems this wasn't enough. About 15 minutes into rehearsal, the fog machines began to act up, and the auditorium began to fill with thick fog. Nate had checked the fog machines right before the rehearsal, and everything had been working well. Now they were on, on their own accord, spewing thick, cloudy vapor throughout the entire theater. Even this didn't make sense, as it usually took several minutes for the fog machines to heat up. How could they have failed in such a spectacular way? Nate ran down the stairs to fix the problem, but he couldn't see in all the fog and fell down the stairs. He scraped his wrist, which eventually became infected, and required medical attention. After this experience, Nate started bringing an entire bag of candy for the rail girl. After doing so, no other incidents marred his theatrical career. Sometimes, the rail girl has allowed people to see her. One such story occurred in 1998. A theater student was in the theater late one night. She was alone and was rehearsing for an upcoming show. While she was rehearsing, the back door of the theater swung open, and a little girl, dressed in a white dress with a pink tie around it, stuck her head through the door and looked around. The student was tired, but said she still saw the girl very clearly. She looked like she was around seven or eight years old. The girl quickly disappeared around the door into the back hallway. The student was confused as to why a child would be in the building so late at night and quickly went to look for her. She looked in every direction, but the little girl was gone. There was nowhere a little girl could have gone in that short amount of time. She had just vanished. Was this the real girl? Another story is told of a student who was working in the control room doing a show when there was a knock at the door. When she opened the door, she saw a young girl dressed in old-fashioned clothing standing on the other side. When she asked, can I help you? The girl said no and ran away. While we may never know who or what the real girl is, there are many stories and first-hand accounts that validate the claim that she exists and is actively haunting the Albert Taylor Theater. The stream head that we mentioned earlier runs directly under the old gymnasium. This may or may not have anything to do with the hauntings associated with the old gymnasium, but it is worth mentioning. Most of the stories that revolve around the old gymnasium have to do with phantom sounds. Several students over the years have reported hearing balls bouncing, scoreboard sounds, and sounds of people running in the gym, only to investigate and find no one there. One student heard applause late at night. Looking around, there was no one in the old gym with her, and the mysterious clapping ended as quickly as it had begun. Most students never get to see the inside of the old gym, as it's become storage and rehearsal space for the theater department. Another story from the mid-1970s is told of a costume designer that often worked late into the night on the upper floor of the old gym. One evening, as she was working, she began to hear the distinct sound of a woman crying. She was sure that she was alone in the building, but someone was clearly crying somewhere downstairs. The crying woman sounded distraught, and the designer became concerned and started to look for the woman. She was sure that the poor girl's heart was broken. As she made her way down the stairs, she began to feel that something was terribly wrong. The further she went, the louder and louder the crying became, until it crescendoed into a quivering scream. Frantic, the designer ran down the stairs. As she got to the bottom of the steps, she realized that the cries were coming from the gymnasium. But it was dark, too dark to see anything. She hurried to the electrical box and switched on the lights, just to have the crying stop immediately. She stood there, faced with an empty view of the gymnasium. She never discovered the cause of the mysterious crying, but she also never forgot it either. Could the water table under the gym act like a battery, storing the energy and emotions from times long past? Something is happening at Milliken's old gym, though what is still mystery. Ashton Hall is the oldest building on Milliken University. It was built as a woman's dormitory and was often referred to as the Woman's Hall. This building was modern for the time and housed female students and staff. Ashton Hall was also the original dining hall where students could eat a meal for seven cents. You can no longer eat at Ashton Hall, but you can possibly experience a ghost. 
There are two origin stories for the female spirit that haunts Ashton Hall. The first tells the story of a young woman who lost her fiancé during World War II and in her grief killed herself. There are no historical records to suggest this is true, but there are records that tell of another tragic suicide that occurred in this building. Bernice Richardson killed herself on February 1, 1927 by drinking carbonic acid. She was disheartened over her poor grades. The bad grades had kept her from attending what would have been her first rush party. Her friends said she joked about not being able to face her parents if her grades were bad. Apparently, this wasn't a joke. Bernice's ghost appears as a frightening apparition that is only discernible from the waist up. She is very solid looking and likes to haunt the third floor dorm rooms. She has been seen crossing hallways and walking through walls. There is also a lot of poltergeist activity on this floor that is attributed to her spirit. This activity includes items moving around, disappearing and reappearing at will. There's also knocking and tapping sounds that seem to be coming from inside the walls. Lights will also turn off and on and doors will open and close. One student claimed to have seen Bernice as recently as 2005. She saw only a flash of her, but knew that it was the ghost of Bernice still haunting Ashton Hall. Both James Milliken and Dr. Albert Taylor didn't want Greek societies at Milliken University. They eventually gave in and allowed the beta chapter of Tau Kappa Epsilon to be a part of the university. Since then, Greek chapters have become a normal part of Milliken. Many of the chapter houses are reported to be haunted as well. The Zeta Tau Alpha House, now the alumni house, is haunted by a ghost named Luis. Luis was a maid who worked for the Mueller family, who owned the house before it became part of the university. She is known to make her presence known on the staircase and in the front foyer. The residents of the house report hearing doors opening and closing and feel as if someone is passing by them when no one is around. Because of these incidents, former ZTA residents dubbed the house foyer Luis's Lounge. The Kappa Sigma house is reported to be haunted by a ghost named Nathan. Nathan was a young man who allegedly committed suicide in the building when it was a boarding house. The most famously haunted Greek house at Millican University is the Delta 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 Sorority House. Many people reported encounters with a ghostly phantom there for generations. The ghost is of a young woman who appears faded. Her clothing is old-fashioned and homespun, similar to those early pioneers might have worn. She is hard to see because her skin is so transparent. Looking at her has been described as being similar to looking at someone's reflection through a pool of murky water. She likes to appear in dorm rooms at night and is often just seen lurking and staring at residents as they sleep. One student tells a story of seeing this ghostly woman after class one afternoon. She was walking down a hallway when the ghost walked right through her, leaving her feeling ice cold. There have been several reports of sorority sisters who were awakened in the night to find a ghost standing over their beds. One woman tells a story of waking up in the middle of the night to see the ghost standing directly over her roommate's bed. She was so scared she took to sleeping with blankets over her head, afraid she would be next. She was right. One night, when she was finally brave enough to take her blankets off and look, the apparition was standing over her bed. Who is this ghostly apparition? An old map of Decatur was discovered that may shed some light on the mystery. According to this map, the Tri-Delta House was once the site of the John Miller Cemetery. This was a private family-owned cemetery and was unknown until it was discovered while the Tri-Delta House was being built. It is assumed that the graves were relocated to build the house, but maybe one of the cemetery's residents decided not to leave. Why are there so many ghosts at Milliken? Unfortunately, time has not been generous or provided a lot of answers to this question. We do know one thing. There are universal feelings that we all experience. 
It doesn't matter what walk of life we hail from, we experience strong emotional, spiritual, and physical feelings in this life. One of the strongest is the pain of not being heard. Is this what haunts Millican University? The pains of spirits begging to be heard? Or is it just an echo of the past burnt into the environment? We may never know, but one thing is certain. Millican University is profoundly haunted.